having a good start to their week. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. We'll get started. <clears throat> so, um, just a reminder of where we're at, uh, where we're going, and how things are going. Um, if you have, you know, if you email me or anything like that, typically my response is going to be, hey, let's talk about it after class since we're all on together. You know, stick around afterwards, and, and usually a conversation needs to be had to get to the, to get to a conclusion to whatever issue you're having. So I know the email is the start of that conversation, but, um, you know, let's follow up with the conversation either after class or in my office hours. The office hour Zoom link is on Blackboard under the Start Here tab. And I have office hours Monday through Thursday, 4 to 5 p.m. And if you need to work on anything or if you have questions about any particular topic, uh, please join and we can work on some stuff and, and get you where you want to be um, in this, in, in your understanding in this class. Uh, that being said, on Friday, we started Chapter 15. So last week, we concluded with Chapter 14. And chapter 14 was pretty dense in terms of introducing factoring and then going to solving quadratic equations through factoring and then word problems where we had quadratics and then we'd factor to solve and then we'd interpret that solution. Um, you know, chapter 14 was, had a lot of, that's a, um, that's a high expectation chapter. This chapter, and at least in my opinion, feels like it's maybe not as intense, all right? So, so far in chapter 15, all we've done is repackage things that we've done before. This is like a repackaging, put some of the skills we've seen in other chapters together, make it seem very complex. I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying there's things you need to pay attention to and know to be successful, but there's not a lot of new math here. If any new math, there's just not much of it. So in 15.1, um, and, and in 15.2, you know, in 15.1, uh, we started uh, factoring and reducing through factoring. And in 15.2, we did multiply and divide. And uh, I should say more. Factoring and reducing, multiplying, divide of rational expressions. And that word rational expressions sounded very, uh, very difficult. But the reality is rational expressions are just fractions. Okay? So we were factoring and then reducing some fractions. We were multiplying and dividing fractions. The next thing we're going to go to, if we've already done multiply and divide, is we're going to add and subtract fractions that look complex and factoring is going to be involved with it but we're going to do it over two sections in 15.3 and 15.4 you know 15.4 is going to be add and subtract these rational expressions um, where we have which are just fractions but they're going to have some factoring to get us there and so today what we're going to see is that least common denominator with rational expressions. What does it look like to find a least common denominator for rational expressions? Because once we get comfortable with least common denominator of rational expressions, then we can go ahead and add and subtract. So on Wednesday, we'll do the adding and subtracting. Today, we're just going to go ahead and look at least common denominator of these rational expressions. And how do we deal with that? And once we learn how to deal with the least common denominator, you know, for to add and subtract fractions, you have to have that common denominator. 1 over A plus 1 over B. Previously, we said AB is our key. We took A times B. We're going to do something similar here. Also, we know that we find that common denominator, but we also rewrite the top numerator of each fraction, okay? And that's what we're going to do today. We're not only going to find that common denominator, we're going to also find um, 
what does that do to the top? Here, this will become 1B and this will become 1A, right? And so we're going to deal with that a little bit today too. How do we change the numerator if we found that least common denominator? So it's actually the same old math. It's just what does it look like when things get a little bit crazy? What does it look like when we're not doing simple items? What, what does it look like when we have maybe some factorable items? So let's take a look. It starts out by telling you how to find the least common denominator of two or more rational expressions. Do I think you need to write this down like you're going to reference it later? No, but it's important to understand that there is a small procedure here, and it should feel like what you would do. For step one, it just says factor all denominators. We're going to factor, and that's kind of the step one of all the stuff we've seen so far with rational expressions. Let's factor first and then do something else. Once we factor, we do something else. Now, step two to find the least common denominator, we're going to find the product, which means multiply. We're going to multiply the unique prime factors from the denominators, in which each factor is raised to the highest power, which it appears in any denominator. Um, an example of that is if I had something like uh, 1 over w minus 3 cubed times 2 over w times w minus 3, what does that look like? You, What is the, um, I shouldn't have put, that's not a time, sorry, I don't want times. I was thinking of, we don't want a times, we want to just put a comma. We're going to find the least common denominator here. We're not going to add or subtract. That's on Wednesday. We're just going to do least common denominator. So what's the least common denominator of these two? Well, the good news is step one's already done. This is already factored for me. These are factors. These are factors. So step two is basically inspect. Take a look at what you've got after you factored. And then you're going to take all the unique prime factors. So our unique prime factors are going to be w minus 3. Well, I already got this w minus 3 and that w minus 3. I need this w. So my unique factors are w, w minus 3. And then to take it further, it says take the highest power to which any of these appear. Well, W is just W to the first. But W minus 3 is to the third, and W minus 3 is to the first. So to take the highest power, we're going to take to the third. That is my least common denominator. And that's where we're going to stop right now. I just want the least common denominator. I would say my answer is W, parentheses, W minus 3 to the third. And I'd leave it just like that. Don't foil it out. Don't multiply it out. That is just fine. What we're going to see towards the end of the section, maybe in about 20 minutes here, we'll see that obviously we need to change the top number, the numerator accordingly as well. If we've got a common denominator here, that changes our numerator as well. And what we'll see is w minus 3 cubed is already here. What's missing? This w. So I would take this times this w. How about this fraction? 2 over w times w minus 3. Well, I have the w already. I have the w minus 3, but I've only got one of them. I've only got one of them. So I need two more to get to my least common denominator. So that's what I need here is w minus 3 squared. This is everything we're going to do today. I just did an example walking us through the entirety of the section. We start with two fractions. We can do more, okay, two or more fractions. I know it says rational expressions. These are fractions. What I did was I found the least common denominator first. It was already factored for me. 
I found the least common denominator. And then I worked back and said, what do they need to get our uh, numerator and denominator e equivalent? Okay, I'm going to change it to this. What does this got to become? And that means this needs a W underneath, and this needs cubed underneath. If I'm going to change it to this common denominator, least common denominator. All right, so that's big picture. Big picture. If that didn't click with you, if that didn't connect with you, in any way, we're going to build our way to it. Uh, if it did connect with you, then this should be a, a nice refresher pick up some clues keys on some more com or, or some different looking things okay so let's look at an example it says find the least common denominator of the rational expressions a just starts out with simple numerical fractions it has 5 over 14 comma 3 over 49 comma 1 over 8 we can still do our two step process remember step 1 is factor and step two is inspect and find the unique factors with the greatest exponents. That's generically what we're going to do, like shorthand what we're going to do. So if I factor 14, I get 2 times 7, or 1 times 14. 49 is going to be 7 times 7, and 8 is 2 times 2 times 2, or that's 2 to the third. By the way, 7 times 7 is 7 squared. So according to this, I now have it factored. My unique factors are 2 and 7. My greatest power is going to be 2 to the third and 7 squared. So my least common multiple is going to be 8 times 49. I need my calculator on this. I get 392. And I hear my dog snoring. I don't know if you guys can pick up on that. She's not going to stop. She snores all day. I apologize. All right, let's look at B. I know it looks different when we do this process with digits and, and letters, but it's the same process. B says 5 over 3x squared z, 7 over x to the fifth, y to the third. Now, this is already factored. We already have this factored. So our least common denominator, our LCD, I'm going to inspect. In the bottom, I have a 3. I have an X. And I have a Y. And I have a Z. 3X, Y, and Z. And now I just take the higher exponent. Well, I have X squared and X to the fifth. I'm going to take X to the fifth. Y is to the third. And Z is just to the first. Now. On A, I could multiply out 2 to the third times 7 squared. There's no multiplying this out. This is my least common denominator. 3x to the fifth, y to the third, z. All right, so factoring there didn't occur, but you can see how um, if we can pick up on the, you know, conceptually understand what's going on here in this process, hey, maybe these rational expressions are even easier than just straight fractions with digits. That wasn't so bad. This looked a lot more messy on A than B did. B, hey, that's not so bad. All right. Let's look at what happens when we add some complexity. Now we are going to have to factor. So go ahead and write A down. We're going to factor and then unique factors, greatest exponent. All right, so A says A plus B 
over a squared minus 25. You've seen enough of these lately. We can recognize 25 is a square, a perfect square. a squared is a perfect square. This is going to give us a plus 5, a minus 5. Again, that's from section 14.5. If you don't understand that, come to my office hours. My other fraction has 1 over 2a minus 10. 2a minus 10 is going to be 2 times a minus 5. There we have factors. Notice I don't care at all about the numerator. I have not cared about the numerator yet. That'll be the next level, the next step we do. But right now, we just care about the denominators. So what are my factors? Well, I have a plus 5, a minus 5. And I have 2. Put the 2 out front. So 2, a plus 5, a minus 5. Notice I've already got a minus 5 listed. I'm not going to list it again because I want unique, different factors. A minus 5 here is not unique to this A minus 5. I inspect for the greatest a exponent. A plus 5 is to the first. A minus 5 is to the first. 2 is for, to the first. A minus 5 is to the first. These are all to the first power. So this is my least common denominator. Two parentheses A plus 5, parentheses A minus 5. Do I need to FOIL this out and multiply it out? No, just leave it just like that. With these rational expressions, it's strange. We work uh, for a lot of years multiplying these things out, and then all of a sudden we get to a point where it's like, hey, we don't need, I know you know how to multiply it out. Let's just leave them as factors. I, we like factors more, pro and really because they simplify easier. We can divide them out, and, and, or, or we can reduce them, like we saw in 15 too. So let's look at B. Write B down. B says x minus 5 over x squared minus 2x and 1 over x squared minus 4x plus 4. Let's see, x minus 5, don't care about the numerator because I'm looking for the least common denominator. X squared minus 2x is going to be x times x minus 2. My other fraction is a numerator of 1. x squared minus 4x plus 4 is going to factor to uh, x minus 2, x minus 2. And I have to inspect here and recognize, look at your factors. This is the same as x minus 2 squared. One of them, two of them, that's x minus 2 squared. And that's very important because when we want the greatest exponent, we have to recognize that this is something by itself two times. So I have an exponent of 2 here. So my least common denominator is going to be x times x minus 2. Those are all my unique factors. There's no other factors here. And then I need to look at the greatest exponent. Well, x is to the first power. x minus 2 here is to the first power. x minus 2 here is to the second power. So I'm going to use the greatest exponent for x minus 2. And we have it to the second power here. So this is my least common denominator. x parentheses x minus 2 squared. All right, let's try a few more. 3 says x over x squared uh, minus 16 and 2 over 3x plus 12. We're going to find the least common denominator. Go ahead and write these down. Let's see where we get. I'm going to give you, why don't you try 3 and 4? I'm going to, I got 1119, 1120 on the clock. 
I'm going to give you till 1123, uh, and then I'll go through these. So go ahead and attempt them for three minutes here. All right, let's take a look. x over x squared minus 16. This is that difference of squares. I noticed 16 is a perfect square. x squared is a perfect square. Plus 4 times x minus 4. 2, 3x plus 12. I can take a 3 out of both. So I get 3 times x plus 4. So now I inspect for my least common denominator. I've got 3 as a factor and x plus 4 times x minus 4. These are all to the first power. So I'm done. Three parentheses, x plus 4, x minus 4. Problem number 4. 6 over, let's see, this is going to factor to t plus 7, t minus 2. 7 times negative 2 is negative 14. 7 minus 2 is 5. And this is going to factor to, let's see, t squared minus 3t plus 12. This is going to factor to t minus 2, t minus 1. Minus 2 times minus 1 is plus 2. Minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3. So now I inspect to get my least common denominator. I have a t plus 7. I have a t minus 2, and I have a t minus 1, and all of these are to the first power. These are my unique. Notice t minus 2 shows up in both, but it's unique one time. I don't have to write them both, and notice they're to the first power, so there's our least common denominator. 
It's okay to have three factors as your least common denominator. It is what it is. The process stays the same. It is what it is. The outcome we get is the least common denominator. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it a step further. So far, we haven't cared about the numerators, but we know if we're gonna add or we're gonna subtract in the future, that's what we're working towards on Wednesday. We know we get that least common denominator, but then the next step is going to be addressing the numerators change as well. So there's a small two-step process. This is just an extension working towards adding and subtracting down the road. So step one is to find that least common denominator. We've done four or five of them now, six of them. So we're getting a feel for that, least common denominator. And then step two says basically to go ahead and, and adjust the numerator accordingly. And it uses a lot of words to get there, but it's the same way of adjusting nu the numerator as we did when they were just digits, when we were adding and subtracting fractions, and we had to adjust the numerator accordingly for the common denominator, we would do the same process, okay? Now, multiply the numerators and denominators of each fraction by the factors from the, LC, from the least common denominator that are missing from the original denominators. That word missing is a good way to, to, to think. I don't know if the rest of the words are, are as helpful because it's very, there's a lot of words there. That's like almost a paragraph. That's a long sentence. And it's very mathy. But basically what they're saying is remember my example from before where I had 1 over A plus 2 over B? Well, our least common denominator was A times B, right? We got it just by multiplying A times B. And then we adjusted the numerator accordingly by multiplying the missing factor. So what we would do back in chapter, I don't know, it was like chapter 10. If this 1 over A was going to become AB underneath, and it was now AB, that means what is missing? Well, I had A. Now I need a B, so it has to have a B up top. My other one, I should have a comma here. My other one for 2 over B, I inspect, I want AB. What is missing from this B? Because I had a B, now I need a B, but it needs an A, all right? That's how we did it before, we would inspect. Our denominator changed from A to AB, what's the change? Well, we got a B underneath, better get a B on top. We had two over B, we had a B, now we want a B. What's the change from B to AB? Well, I had an A added, so I better add it on top. That's what we're saying here. Maybe they say it better than I do. Maybe you prefer those words, but I don't expect you to, to really write that down. I think in practice, this will make sense. So let's take a look at uh, converting the least common denominator. We're going to find the least common denominator and then convert each expression to an equivalent fraction, which just means we're one step from adding and subtracting. Okay? We're just getting one step away. So on A, write down three over 2ab and a number 6 over 5a squared. Three over 2ab and 6 over 5a squared. Our least common denominator through inspection is going to be 2 times 5, because 2 and 5 are both prime, so those are unique. 2 times 5 times a squared times b because a and b are unique a is not unique but a to the second is our biggest exponent all right so 2 times 5 times a squared b 2 times 5 is 10 our least common denominator is 10 a squared b let's look at that again 2 and 5 they're unique so 2 times 5, they're both to the first power. A is unique. A squared is not unique, but I'm going to use A squared because it's the biggest exponent. B 
is unique and it's to the first power. So when we multiply this out, we get two times five is 10, a squared b. So that's our least common denominator. So what's that going to do to our fractions? Our fractions are now gonna be written with denominators of 10a squared b. What's that gonna do for our numerators? I'm gonna make some space here. What's that gonna do for our numerators? Where our numerator was three, so that stays. And now I inspect my denominator, because I'm gonna multiply three times whatever I need. Well, to go from two to 10, I took it times five. To go from A to A squared, I need an A. And B to B stays, so this is gonna be three times five A. My other fraction had a six, it's gotta stay. I'm gonna make that a blue six, because it's the original. So we're going to have 6 times, now the 6 had a denominator of 5a squared, so from 5 to 10 was times 2, a squared to a squared is times 1, but I need a b, right? A b is missing here, so I'm going to take it times 2b. Now notice I put what's missing in parentheses, because now to finish the problem, I'm going to multiply these out. 3 times 5a is 15a over my 10a squared b. And 6 times 2b is 12b over 10a squared b. Now notice this entire process sets us up for adding or subtracting. This could easily be a plus or it could easily be a minus problem. Because I have common denominators, I can combine these two fractions now. Okay, I'll let you get that in your notes and we'll look at problem B. All right, let's take a look at problem B. B is 4 over x plus 1 and 7 over x minus 4. So I've got to start with my least common denominator. My factors are going to be x plus 1. This doesn't factor because it's x minus 4. They might be trying to get you on, hey, is this a difference of squares? It's not because it's not x squared. It's just x minus 4. So that's our least common denominator. So our least common denominator means it's going to change to x plus 1 times x minus 4 for both. Do I need to multiply, FOIL that out? No, you don't. The original fractions had 4 on this first one and 7, so I'm going to leave them there. I'm going to multiply by whatever I need to change. Whatever I change my denominator by, I'm going to change my numerator by. On this 4 over x plus 1, I had x plus 1 as my denominator. I have that here, but obviously I'm missing that x minus 4. Okay. 7 over x minus 4 has the x minus 4, but it's obviously missing the x plus 1. And so my final answer is going to be 4 parentheses x minus 4 over x plus 1 times x minus 4, and 7 times x plus 1 over x plus 1 times x minus 4. Those are going to be my uh, equivalent fractions for, from the least common denominator. And then obviously I can now add or subtract as I want to. Now, when we get into adding or, or subtracting, we pr probably most likely should, in fact, we will multiply the tops out and get 4 times x minus 16, and then 7 times x is 7x uh, plus 7. But we don't need to do that right now because we're not adding or subtracting them. 
we're just changing the numerator in the same way that we change the denominator. Okay? So understand we will get to that if but we're not right now. And I think someone just asked a question. Uh, you don't have to multiply. All right. So right now, I don't think so. Um, I would take four, 4 times x minus 4. You can do it on the numerator. You don't need to do it on the denominator. Okay? It, it becomes, you'll find out that it turns into the long way when we multiply our denominators. And then later on, we'll want to undo that by factoring it out. So again, we get to a spot in our math journey where leaving factors as factors becomes easier. Now again, moving forward, if we were going to add these, then these become important. We would multiply it out if we're going to add the fractions or if we're going to subtract the fractions. It makes sense to do that. But right now, this is four parentheses x minus four is our uh, the expression with a to an equivalent fraction with the denominator equal to the least common denominator. Very wordy, but we've changed the numerator accordingly. We don't need to multiply it out just yet. Let's try this one. This one looks interesting. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to find the least common denominator, and then we're going to change the numerators accordingly. So we have w plus 2 over w squared minus w minus 12, and we have 1 over w squared minus 9. So I'm going to rewrite my fractions factored. w plus 2, and this w squared minus w minus 12 is going to be, let's see, w minus 4, w plus 3. My other fraction is 1 over w squared minus 9. That, that is a difference of squares because it's w squared minus 3 squared. 9 is 3 squared. So I get w plus 3, w minus 3. So my least common denominator is going to be w minus 4, w plus 3. Now this w plus 3 means this w plus 3 is no longer unique. I don't need to write it again. It's not going to be to the second power because these are both to the first power. w minus 3 is unique. And this is my least common denominator. Should I multiply it out? No. It, it's going to be the long way if you multiply it out. We want to be able to see these factors because now I'm going to change my fractions accordingly. Now, big deal here. This w plus 2 needs to stay grouped. This w plus 2, I'm going to write in parentheses. For when I rewrite this fraction with my new common denominator. And so as I inspect this, I notice what is missing. I have w minus 4, okay. I have w plus 3, okay. But what is missing is w minus 3. And now I write that in parentheses. And you can see how important grouping w plus 2 together is. Because if we multiply this out, then we would FOIL, OK? You would take w times w, w times minus 3. 2 times w, 2 times minus 3. You would FOIL that out. We need to right now for this section? I don't think so. We can just leave it w, 2 times w minus 3. Now, if this were a plus problem, we would have to FOIL that out. If this were a minus problem, like it will be on Wednesday, we would have to FOIL that out. We just don't need to right now. It's not necessarily the purpose of this lesson. How about the other fraction? We had a 1, which we can, re -re we can rewrite 1 times. Okay. And what is missing? Uh, well, I already had, um, let's see, I'm going to have W, sorry, I'm going to have W minus 4 times w plus 3 
times w minus 3. I already had w plus 3 and w minus 3, so all that's new is w minus 4, so that gets added to the numerator. Okay, so here are my two new fractions in anticipation of adding or subtracting. But we're not doing that just yet. That's what we'll do on Wednesday. All right, why don't you guys try this one? It's 1140 on my clock here. I'll give you till 1143 to see where you get, and then I'll chime in uh, with, with the work. So try this one. All right, so I'm going to start. Keep working. Don't let me disrupt you. See if we get to the same spot. So on the first one, we have z over z squared minus 4, so I'm going to factor that to z, uh, z plus 2, z minus 2. My other one, I have minus 3 over, let's see, this is going to be z minus 2, z plus 1. 2 times 1 is minus 2, minus 2 plus 1 is plus 1. And so my least common denominator is going to be z plus 2, z minus 2. This z minus 2 is no longer unique, so I'm not going to rewrite it. And I'm left with z plus 1. Right, this one. So I actually only took this one, this one, and this one essentially. I don't need to rewrite z minus 2 again. It's not squared because it's to the first power, and this one's to the first power. So how do I change my um, fractions accordingly? Well, this will be written as z over, I'm going to write my least common denominator, z plus 2, z minus 2, z plus 1. I'm going to inspect what is missing. Let's see, I have z plus 2, z minus 2. I'm missing the z plus 1. Uh, my other fraction had a minus 3 on top. I'm going to rewrite that common denominator. z plus 2, z minus 2, 
Z plus one. And now I'm going to inspect. It has a Z minus two, Z plus one. It needs Z plus two. Okay. And to me, where we're at right now, these are totally acceptable answers. You don't have to get Z squared plus Z. You don't have to get minus three Z minus six. Okay, these are uh, just fine, okay? Now, Wednesday, there's going to be a plus sign or a minus sign, and then we do need to simplify the numerators to get to our conclusion, okay? One last thing I want to show you before you go is that same old idea that we saw at the end of uh, Friday morning. We saw a little bit of Friday afternoon, and it's that idea of what to do uh, basically with that, with denominators that look very similar, x minus 7, 7 minus x, they've got the pieces, but minus 7 is not the same as plus 7, and x is not the same as minus x. We can do this one of two ways, okay? We can either, we can either factor the minus 1 out of here to get 7 minus x, or we can factor the minus one out of here to get x minus seven. What does that look like? Well, if we factored the minus one out of here, we would end up with three over minus negative x plus seven. And notice now we have common denominators, even though it doesn't look the same. This can be written as minus uh, three over seven minus x. So now notice we do have a common denominator. Or we can pull the minus 1 out of this one. So there's a big or here. Okay? There's a big or here. This would be a correct way, where the other fraction is 1 over 7 minus x. Or we could pull the minus 1 out of here and get uh, the 1 over minus negative 7 plus x. Negative 7 plus x can be written as x minus 7. So we end up with the same denominator as the other. Okay? Either way is fine. That's why I use a big or here. You do not have to do both to be successful at adding or subtracting fractions. You just have to pick one of them and do it. That'll get you your common denominator, and you can go from there. All right. Uh, we got about three minutes left. I'm going to hit stop share in a moment. I'm going to stop recording. Stay if you have any questions. Otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday. And remember, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but you do have an assignment due Friday and up through 14.5 and you, or up through 15.4, sorry. And you have a lab test due Sunday this Sunday, so it's okay if you guys start working on those things, okay?